But elimination of use of antibiotics is growth promoters in disease form. And about half a dozen other things that I think most of us would agree made a lot of sense. That challenge was uh, issued three and a half years ago. Smithfield's still unable to. They claimed, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that. But uh, So I think there are ways of engaging them, but, but the business model and the ability of currently exists for them to externalize so many of their costs and sell a product at a price that uh, the American consumer likes. I mean, we're paying 10% of disposable income for our food, lowest of any population in the history of the world. And uh, that's because we've socialized all of the real expenses. Um, for those of you who wondered about community gardens, I've been doing a study of community gardens. That's my workshops on tomorrow. Please come. My question to you is, um, in the Midwest, we have a lot of food co-ops, but there aren't any in the East or other parts of the country. And I wonder if you can explain why that might be and if food co-ops offer us any hope. Um, there are a few food co-ops. Uh, there's one in Rockland, Maine that I know of. Uh, there are a lot of CSAs and uh, consumer supported agriculture. And we we were just uh, earlier in the week, Cynthia and I were talking with some friends about uh, CSAs and they both admitted to being CSA dropouts. And part of the problem with CSAs is that uh, in the Northeast at least, uh, they don't get started until May, and they usually wind up by November or December. Um, there's a period in late summer when you get mostly kale. Uh, and there are other issues. Now, kale is a wonderful, healthy food, but I think that uh, we need to work out some of those kinks of uh, what makes for a, a year-round CSA, uh, what makes for a, a co-op that uh, can bring in fresh, freshly sourced foods from other parts of the country during the winter months in the Northeast. Uh, but what is, what is your thought about what makes for a good co-op? Well, when I mention co-op, I'm not thinking of CSAs. I'm talking about cooperative stores. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, there's no chains. Um, but uh, especially in the North Central states, there are co-ops in many cities that are grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And they are owned by their members, but they are open to the public. And they are an alternative way of shopping. But their, their food is organic, and so on, and so on, and so on. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, is that a usable model? I think it is, and, and, and I was just trying to make the distinction between uh, the co-op and the CSA as an example of another effort where there is supporting local agriculture through prepayment and, and having access to uh, healthier, most, mostly organically raised foods. I don't know enough about the co-op movement to uh, say more than that. Thank you. You mentioned BPA regarding the endocrine disruptors. And I am concerned about other kinds of energy disruptions, such as the water I drink from the, the Potomac River, where the small and large amounts of gas are now bisexed. And I'm told it's very expensive to treat this water at the water treatment plant. Yes. And I wonder if you can expand a little bit more on the effects of energy. The, uh the dominant endocrine disruptor in the, Potom in the Potomac that's causing the hermaphroditic bass um, is atrazine. And atrazine is the uh, most commonly used herbicide in U.S. agriculture. Uh, the U.S. Geologic uh, Survey studied the 52 largest water systems in the United States 
<clears throat> six or seven years ago, and they found uh, atrazine and then a whole bunch of other persistent organic pollutants in parts per million and then some lots in parts per billion uh, in all 52 water systems. So you're not being singled out by drinking from the Potomac. It's a serious problem. Uh, and just to go back to this connection with externalities and who and our regulatory process not working properly, um, in Des Moines, Iowa, the water system has to extract nitrogen and atrazine from the water before it meets EPA standards for human consumption. As you said, it's a very expensive process. The atrazine is applied by the agricultural industry in Iowa. Who pays the cost of extraction? The citizens of Des Moines in their water bill. So if you could get the ag industry to pay the cost of cleanup, they would probably figure out more efficient ways of using atrazine, or maybe integrated pest management so they didn't even need to use a persistent organic pollutant for as an herbicide. So I think that um, growing public awareness of what we're doing to our water, growing awareness of what we're doing to our air, uh, if that can be marshaled as, and one of the things that as a public health person I continue to think back on, as C. Everett Coop took environmental tobacco smoke and made it a moral issue. He said, you can smoke and kill yourself, but you have no right to smoke and kill your neighbor or the person sharing the office with you. We haven't quite figured out how uh, to invoke those kinds of moral ethics, values, and concerns about what we're doing to our fellow citizens through these activities. And once we can do that, that's going to be another added uh, impetus, I think, to regulatory reform. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. celebration of uh, friends and colleagues uh, to us. Uh, it's remarkable. I wish your friends and colleagues could see you right now continuing to answer every question with care, concern, and honesty, and, and hope, and, and push, pushing us to do the things we need to do. This was an incredible opportunity for us to be sharing with you today. This is, the, I really thank you very much. Uh, I want to call Look, we were, in, we we're energized, I hope, from this. We have these five tables. We need your help. Your help is going to make the difference. We can't translate. We know There's a lot known that's been shared with you. You have to come back and start to reformulate this so that we can make a difference. It is now official lunchtime. Let me just point out two things. One is that we have a one o'clock start back in this room for an incredible uh, start of the afternoon. And we have two other interesting pieces of video. The continuation on genetically modified food from Sir Brian Heap from the UK the heads up the EU Commission, Scientific Commission on, on advice to the EU, EU. There it is. We're getting it straight from them. The second thing is we have a surprise. We got an actual interview with the director of King Corn. So the, the director of the film has given us a completely new perspective on what's happened since King Corn and how it, how it influenced what he's doing now, but more than that, how films get made like that and where that kind of documentary is going. And that was the first of the big the food documentaries. We're going to show that at 10 o'clock tonight, but we're going to try and show the video after our celebration at this afternoon so that you'll get a preview from the director about what the film is at 10 o'clock. Thank you.